Okay, Shalom, praise the Lord. Um, welcome everyone to class. Thank you online students for joining us. So welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture uh, later on. Uh, last week, we began studying Romans chapter 4, where Paul is basically telling the Jews and the Gentiles that they will be justified by faith right so he's talking about justification by faith and uh, he's saying it's not through the law okay or it's not through circumcision it's not by following some rituals but he says that you are justified or you are made righteous by faith and whose examples that he uses abraham and David, yes, he uses the examples of uh, Abraham and David. Okay, so we said in this chapter four, it can be divided into two sections. Uh, in one section, he establishes that faith came before the law and the covenants. Okay, so Genesis chapter 15, verse six, where he says that uh, uh, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he says he was. He believed and he was declared as righteous or the righteousness of God was credited into his account, so to say, uh, before even the covenant was made. That is in Genesis chapter 17 when God makes a covenant with him. And even before the law was made, he was justified by faith okay so and he also gives another example of uh, david okay so he, why does he give examples of uh, abraham and david they the yes they have the patriarchs the forefathers okay uh, abraham was their patriarch their forefather and david was their uh, king okay uh, through whom god promised the 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 rule and the reign of kings for generations to um, come okay so he's saying that hey when when abraham was justified by faith and not keeping the law then we also each one of us will just be justified or be made righteous in god's sight by faith okay and then he goes on to the second part where we're looking at we will talk more about um, righteousness by faith and also uh, the circumcision that is what we are looking at the second half you know romans chapter 4 verses 9 um, following okay so before we look at that we will just pause for a word of prayer so can one of you please lead us in prayer please anyone take the mic just lead us in prayer yes Father, we thank you for this wonderful time, Lord. Once again, we come to your presence, and as we're going to uh, do worldly study about your word of God, Lord Jesus, we ask your wisdom, knowledge to understand more deeply about you, Father. Give us new words, new revelation from your word, Father. Thank you so much. Uh, help us to learn. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So here, the second half is talking about righteousness given by faith even before circumcision. So the first half, he's, he's fully convinced the Jews that righteousness is by faith, by giving the example of Abraham and how Abraham was justified by faith. And now he's talking about, you know, that people will not, cannot be justified or made righteous in God's sight by the uh, sign of the covenant, the physical sign of the covenant, that is circumcision, but, you know, even before the circumcision which was given, Abraham was declared righteous by God. Okay, so that is what he mentions in verses 9 following. So can somebody please read verses 9 to 12, please, for us? Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For so we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the signs of sign of uncircumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which the which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, 
but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father abram had while still uncircumcised amen so it's amazing how paul is revealing the mind of god about faith for both the jews and the gentiles so having established from the old testament examples of righteousness given or based on faith now paul is addressing about the whole question of circumcision okay so he's saying was this righteousness given because of circumcision was this righteousness given to abraham because of circumcision and then paul points out that you know abraham received righteousness by faith that is in genesis chapter 15 verse 6 before even he received the sign of circumcision that is in genesis chapter 17 verse 10 okay so even before the circumcision which was given to him or the sign of circumcision he was justified by faith or he was made righteous by uh, faith because he believed in god and so he says abraham was blessed and he received his blessing now how did he receive his blessing yes verse 9 says by faith it was accounted to abraham for righteousness so paul is saying hey did he receive it when he was circumcised or did he receive when he was uncircumcised so he says hey he received it when he was uncircumcised and later on he received circumcision which was a seal of righteousness of faith so he says the right the circumcision that came about later on was actually the seal of the righteousness of faith but he was already declared righteous uh, by God. So God gave him this covenant after God gave him righteousness through faith. Okay. So the covenant that God gave him of circumcision, God gave him after he gave him righteousness through faith. Okay. So the, the reason God gave him is the latter part of verse 11. Why? Why is what is the reason God gave him this? Why is it, what, what is the reason God gave him righteousness by faith? Look at the latter part of verse 11. What is the answer? Yeah, the righteousness was imputed. That means it was put into his account. But the, what was the reason God gave it to him? Look at verse 11, the latter part of verse 11. What is the answer? What is the, why, what is the reason God gave him? or declared him righteous by faith. Ah, so that Abraham could be the father of all who believe. So Paul is kind of stretching their thinking, you know, he's getting them to think more deeply. Okay. So Abraham, before he had the circumcision, he had faith. And so Abraham is the father of all who have faith look at how he is so beautifully saying so he's saying hey if you're calling abraham your father then what should you have first faith so the only your faith will make you righteous then all the other things okay but he's saying that before he had circumcision he had faith so abraham is the father of all who have faith okay so verse 12 paul is saying hey it's not just circumcision but you know that you have to hold on to that abraham got this covenant abraham followed it he did it to his son and all you know in his household we also have to do it you can't hold on to only that but what should you hold on to if you are saying abraham is your father he's saying that you also need to walk in the faith of abraham see how beautifully he brings it right he brings them to a place where they cannot argue, they cannot, because this is just pure scripture that he's taking and he's showing them from. Okay. So here he's stating two things. He's saying Abraham received righteousness by faith, so that he will be the father of everyone who walks in faith, even if they are uncircumcised, which means the Gentiles, okay, or even if they are circumcised, which means the Gentiles all have to be made righteous by faith or all can be made righteous only by faith 
The second thing he's saying is a, he's a father of circumcision. But it's not really of circumcision that you need to walk, but you need to walk in the faith of Abraham. That is what will bring you righteousness, or that is what will make you righteous. Not circumcision, but walking in the faith of Abraham. So Paul is saying, even if you're circumcised, even if you're uncircumcised, you, we all have to walk in the faith like Abraham. Now imagine the, a Jew is reading this. Right? What will he say? What do you think he will say? Come on, what do you think he'll say? Yeah, this is correct. Yes, this is true. I cannot argue with what Paul is saying because scripture says that Abraham was made righteous by faith even before the law, even before the circumcision, uh, the sign of the covenant was given. And a Gentile you can say that, you know, yes, through faith I can be made righteous. I don't need to be circumcised. So that was, and for us it might seem a simple thing, but for in the early church during Paul's time, this was a big issue. This was something that was such a big issue. It was kind of dividing the church. It was causing confusions. The Jews were trying to impose themselves on the Gentiles. The Gentiles were like, hey, I thought, you know, just accept Jesus Christ. And, you know, these people are telling us to do all of these things we don't want to do. So there was a lot of confusion. So for them now, there was more clarity, both for the Jews and for the Gentiles. Now, Paul slowly moves on to Abraham's faith to talk about what was his faith like and what can we say about Abraham's faith. Okay, so he just said, yes, we have to walk in the faith of Abraham. He says that it was Abraham's faith that made, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, caused God to credit his righteousness on him. But what was his faith? What was Abraham's faith like? Okay, so we'll um, look at... Uh, that okay so just in uh, as a conclusion circumcision was a sign that abraham had al already had faith and that god had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous okay so circumcision was just a sign that abraham already had faith and that god had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is a spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. So we also come into that category, right? And they are counted as righteous because of their faith. And how are we counted righteous before God? Because of our faith in what Jesus has done on the cross and his righteousness has been imputed upon us. We are clothed with his righteousness. And then we also uh, learned here that he received the sign of circumcision as a seal or confirmation of the righteousness which he had by faith. Okay, So circumcision was just a seal of that confirmation that he was made righteous by the faith that he had Okay, while he was still uncircumcised. So Abraham was made righteous through faith while he was still uncircumcised and this was so that he could be the father of all who believe those who are even uncircumcised so that the righteousness could be credited to all those who believe whether they are circumcised or uncircumcised so that is just like a summary and a conclusion now we'll move on the verses 13 to 16 and following we see the promises based on faith because of grace and we are also going to look at what paul talks about what was abraham's faith like and what can we say about abraham's faith so that we will uh, we will study now in uh, in verses 13 following so can somebody read verses 13 to 16 please 13 to 16 for the promise that he would be the here of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For for if those who are of the law are hers, faith is made void and the promise made of effects, no effects, because the law brings about worth of 
word for where there is no wrath, law. For the, because the law brings wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgressions. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Amen. Thank you, Chira. So the promise that God gave to Abraham was something he gave at the point of faith and righteousness before circumcision. So the promise was through righteousness of faith. And it's not just for those who are of the law who receive this promise, but it is for everyone who has faith who will inherit this promise. Isn't that beautiful? Because he says, what is... He says in verse 30, for the promise that he would be a heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So if you are believe Jesus Christ, you will be made righteous by faith and you will receive the promise that God gave to Abraham. Okay, so that is what he's saying. So what is the promise? The promise is I will bless you and make you a blessing right so the promise was given to abraham and to his descendants and when was this promise given look at what paul is very smartly saying this promise was given to him even before the law was given isn't that beautiful i mean look at how paul is so beautifully saying it hey this promise was given to abraham that your you and your descendants will be blessed and i will make you a blessing when was it given not after he gave the law, but even before the law was given. Okay, So the promise is not just given to those who are descendants of those who are given the law and the circumcision. So he's saying, hey, this promise is not just for the Jews. You Jews, not just because you have the law and the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision. But, you know, this promise is given to all those who have faith in Jesus. Christ. All those who have faith in Jesus Christ will inherit this promise. And what is that promise? I will bless you and you will be and I will make you a blessing. Okay. So hence he's saying Abraham is the father of us all. Who is the us all? All who believe, all who have faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul is repeating his point that Abraham is the father of all who have faith and all who have faith now receive the promise that God gave Abraham that is according to grace. Okay. And so it is what he's talking is faith through faith, righteousness through righteousness, grace, right? The grace of God is given to us by righteousness and it's given to everyone who is everyone both jews and gentiles alike who have faith in jesus christ okay and now in verse 17 he gets on to the faith of abraham okay any questions so far verses um, 13 to 16 any questions you have no Any questions, online students? Okay, there are no questions. We'll move on to verse 17, where he talks about, uh, he gets into the faith of Abraham. Okay, the steps of the faith of Abraham. So can somebody please read verses 14 to verses 21, please? Uh, sorry, 17 to 21, please. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him who he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who contrary to hope, in hope believed that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall descendants be and not being walk in faith, he did consider his own body already dead since was about a hundred years old and the descendants of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at deadness. Yeah. 
in the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Amen. So this passage is very interesting, okay, because verses 17 to 21, the Holy Spirit is summarizing Abraham's life of faith. Now, why do we say because the Holy Spirit is, uh, why do we say the Holy Spirit is summarizing Abraham's faith? Yeah, the Holy Spirit has inspired Paul to write it. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is giving a summary of Abraham's faith. But if you notice in these verses, it does not mention about Abraham's struggle or mistakes. Does it mention Abraham's struggle of unbelief? Did Abraham also have unbelief? Yes, he did. Yes, he struggled you know, to believe what God had given him when he doesn't see the promise. He's waiting for almost 25 years, 15 years, 25 years. And does he make mistakes? Yes. So we see that there is no mention of Abraham's struggle or mistakes. In fact, if we did not read about Abraham's life in Genesis and just read the book of Romans, we would say, wow, what a man of faith. He had such great faith. But we know about the kind of faith Abraham asked, had. Okay, When God asked him to leave his father's household, we know he stepped out in faith. But after that, we know he made mistakes. Okay, Twice he was afraid for his own life. And he said a partial lie. He said a half-truth that his wife was his sister. Right? Just to save himself so that he would not be killed. He lied saying that his wife is his sister. He spoke the partial lie. Okay. And we also know when we read Genesis chapter 15, you know, before God makes a covenant with Abraham, we see that Abraham was tired of waiting for God's promise to come to pass, okay, of having a son. So he tells God, God, am I going to have a son? It's been like 15 years in this faith journey, okay? There is no sign of the son of the promise. So did you actually mean, God, that I will, I will have a son through Sarah? Uh, or did you mean anyone else that would be born in my family, okay? Through Eliezer, maybe his main servant, one of his sons will become his, you know? Uh, then what does God say? What does God tell Abraham? Genesis chapter 15, God makes a covenant with him, right? God cuts a covenant with Abraham, okay? But we also know that after Genesis 15, Abraham was prompted by Sarah and Abraham waited long, you know, and he may have thought maybe God went, I'll have a son with anyone in my house, okay? And when he was prompted by Sarah and pushed by her, he gave in. And, you know, he births Ishmael through Hagar, okay? That was also a mistake that he made. So from scripture, we see that Abraham's life of faith was not perfect, okay? But when Holy Spirit is looking back at Abraham's life, he's not mentioning about his low days or his, um, you know, upsetting days or sad days or his long days of waiting and, and sometimes unbelief as well and failure, okay? So he's not looking at all of those things. And so that's a powerful lesson for us to uh, learn. In our walk of faith, we might have ups and downs, but God wants us to keep going and ultimately we journey into that place of perfect Faith. And that is where Abraham comes. You know, we see that Abraham journeys through all of these ups and downs, through all of these doubts, you know, asking God, really, 
will a son be born to Sarah's womb? Will it be from Eliezer, then finally makes a mistake and, you know, have births Ishmael through um, Hagar and all of those things he does. But we see in spite of all of this, he comes to perfect faith. Why do I say he comes to perfect faith? All this helps him to come to perfect faith. Can you tell me, how can I say he comes to perfect faith? Come on, it's, you should, the answer will be obviously in the Bible, right? I can't just say of the Bible. How do we know from the Bible that he came to a place of perfect faith? God, tes God testifies he has perfect faith? No, God testifies, but how did Abraham come to perfect faith? Abraham had doubts, right? He had unbelief. He asked God so many times. Yeah, but... When did he believe? Son, yes. You know, when does he come to perfect faith? It happened uh, to Abraham, we read in Genesis chapter 22. When God told Abraham to sacrifice his son, what does he do? He listens, he obeys, no questions asked. God, is this you speaking? I don't think it's you. You giving me my son and telling me to sacrifice my only son. You know, I can't have any more sons. And you said, it's not through Eliezer. It's not even Ishmael. And you want me to sacrifice? I think, God, it's not you. I think it's, you know, somebody else. Or it's just my voice. No, but what does he do? He's convinced. No ounce of doubt. This time he doesn't ask God anything, right? Earlier he does when he doesn't see the son of promise. Right? But this time there's no even little doubt. Okay? What does he do? Next day he takes the servants, takes the knife, takes the animal for the sacrifice. Uh, sorry, the he takes the wood and he goes, because his son is not, no, he doesn't take the animal, his son is a sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. He takes the wood, takes the knife, takes the fire, and off he goes. And so, you know, his son also says, Father, the wood is here, the fire is here. Where is the animal for the sacrifice? And what does Abraham say? God will give my son. He will give. Okay. So he's ready to offer his son as a sacrifice. And why is he ready to offer his son as a sacrifice? God, he's sure that God will raise him up to life. He was convinced that even if he offered Isaac, as a sacrifice, God would raise him up. So we see he comes to a place of perfect faith. Okay, so beautiful. Right? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19 says, Can somebody read Hebrews 11, 19? Yes, Chaya, thank you. It's unwavering faith. Yes. Yeah, Hebrews 11, 19. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him a figurative sense. Yes, so he's saying that Abraham was convinced that God can even raise up his son from the dead. So, as far as Abraham and God were concerned, it was though a resurrection had taken place. Right? For Abraham, it was like his son was resurrected back to dead. Okay, he says from the dead from which he also received him. So as far as Abraham was concerned, Isaac was as good as dead. And it was from the dead he received him back. And he says it is in a figurative manner, in a manner that was figurative of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so now for Abraham to come to that place where he was fully persuaded that God would fulfill his promise, it did not happen overnight, right? It was not a smooth journey. But he got to that place where he was fully persuaded that what God had promised for his life, God is able to perform it. Amen? Or God will perform it. Amen? Yes? So he got to that place, and it's not overnight. It was a long journey. And that journey was, hey, God told me I'll have a son. He gave me a son. God said, I will be blessed. He has blessed me. He said, 
through me, my descendants will be blessed. I am seeing them blessed. And so when God is telling me, sacrifice your son, I know he will be able to even raise him up. So he comes to that, to that place of full, you know, um, mature faith. Okay. So Holy Spirit, through Apostle Paul, is looking at Abraham's faith in that sense and highlighting and showing us that we can also come to this mature faith. Amen? Amen? So how can we come to that mature faith? How can we come to that mature faith? Okay, by believing what? The word. The written word. Okay, believing the written word. Okay, how else can we come to that mature faith? Like Abraham. How else can we come to that mature faith like Abraham? God fulfills, he's seen God, the fulfillment of God's promise, yes. How can we be, how can we come to that mature faith? Can you give him the mic, please? Believing the word of God because uh, now we have full word of God so we can read, meditate. Mm -hmm. So whatever, however we want. Mm. So as God says in all areas, so maybe we can uh, mature through the word of God. Yes, we read God. God's word. Yes, we meditate, we declare, we speak God's word. Okay, what else? What else? Look at your past life through obedience to what God says, okay? Look at your past life. When you look at your past life, what do you see? The faithfulness of God. You see the goodness of God. You, was, you have seen yourself many times in the PIT. What is PIT? Pit, right? And God has removed you from the pit, you know? And um, many times when he has done supernatural miracles and wonders, and I think we forget all of those, right? What we always remember about our past is all the negative things. What happened, negative, what people did to us, again negative, what we should have done, how we were failures, you know. Um, yes, we keep strengthening our faith by our past experience. How do we strengthen our faith by our past experience? Not by looking at the past and thinking about, oh, I went through this, I went through that, I went through so much of failure, difficulties, backstabbing, oh, blah, blah, blah. We can go on and on with all the negatives. But do we think about the positives? I think if we think more about what God has done in our lives, and how God has brought us out of different situations, yes, how God has worked in different situations, how he is faithful, how he has provided, we'll come to a place where we say, hey, where am I now? Where I was in the past, right? Some of you can even think and say, hey, I don't think I will be even seated here. I would have ended my life long time back. It's only the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God. Hey, I am, uh, you know, having so much of blessings. At one point of time as a family, we were struggling to eat even one or two meals a day. We went through so much of difficulties and challenge. Hey, when I was in school, I was such a naughty child or, you know, failure. But see how God is using me today, right? I always remember, you know, um, when I was in 10th standard, my teacher told me, don't write your 10th standard. I was writing ICSE, my Delhi board exams. Don't write your 10th standard ICSE exams. You will fail because you will surely fail in English, she told me. Uh, she was my English teacher. Because I had spelt does, you know, does, D-O-E-S. I had spelt it and gave her a dose, D-O-S-C. So she took a deep dose of it and gave me one nice dose. She said, don't write your exams. You will fail surely. You know, I passed and I got, I think I got 80s in my English in ICSE, which is a good uh, grade. And uh, after that, I have written, uh, I, I've written three curriculums and I've written one book that on Old Testament characters that is used worldwide in theological schools. And every time I write, 
I know that it is not me. I don't have the skill, the grace. It's, I, I know I don't have the talent. It's only the grace of God. I know how I suffer to communicate. But every time God puts me in writing, you know, I'm just thinking at what my English teacher told me and how God has taken me. So, you know, when you look back, you need to look at all of the memorials, raise them up as memorials. And that is what God did even in the Old Testament, right? He tells Moses in, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9, he tells Moses, you know, um, do not forget the things your eyes have seen and let it not depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. Why? Why should Moses teach the children and the grandchildren all of these things what God has done in the past? For them to know who God is, what is his nature, what has this God done for his for their forefathers, their grandfather, their great-grandfather, their parents, so that they will know their God and put their faith and trust in God. And even when the Israelites cross the uh, Jordan, God tells them, take 12 stones and make a memorial. And he says, when your children, great-grandchildren ask you, what are these stones? Tell them about the deeds of the Lord. So he says, you know, uh, take those stones that shall be memorial to your, the children of Israel for ever. Joshua chapter 4. It's not there in your notes. Uh, I'm just giving you Joshua chapter 4 verses 1 to 7. Okay. Saying, hey, make that memorial. So the children are saying, what are these stones? Grandpa or dad, then you tell them the story what God has done. So why is God doing all this so that people will not forget about what God has done in the past? And why, why is it important for them to know what God has done in the past? He can do greater things. They can put trust and faith in him. They will not repeat the mistakes of the past, what their forefathers have done, a stubborn, rebellious, stiff-necked people. Okay, they will learn from their past of their forefathers. They will not repeat it. They will know who their Lord, their God is. And they will not go and worship the idols. Okay, and look at what uh, the psalmist says in Psalm 44 verses 1 to 4. Can somebody read that please? Psalm 44 verses 1 to 4. We have heard with our ears, O oh God, our fathers have told us what deeds you did not you did in their days. So how did they know? They heard with their ears. Why did they hear with their ears? Because their fathers told them. And what did their fathers tell them? What God has done in their past. Okay. Yes. How you draw out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. How you afflicted the pupils and cast them out, for they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them, but it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, countenance, because you favored them. You are my king, O God, command victories for Jacob. So what are this younger generation saying? God, you did all this. All these great nations know you won victory over them. It's not because the Israelites won the war by themselves, but it's your hand that caused them to win the victory. And he's, what is the generation saying now? Because you have won those victories, now you command victories for Jacob. So beautiful, right? They're saying, now God, you command victories for us. So we can say, God, because you have done this in the past, we pray that you command victories for us in this area okay and i think god is more than pleased when we think about all the things that he's done in the past and you know that what and trust him to do it in the in the future okay or in the present i i know my dad's always uh, you know person whenever we go to him with any problem or we're sitting down or talking he'll always go back to the past and he say how god brought us out how god did this for us how god helped me in the situation help us in the situation that is why you are here in this place <laughs> you know he'll not stop 
uh, recounting all of those things even i think sa uh, saturday the the current had gone away uh, there was no current and our ups is not working and there was uh, it, it was you know pitch dark my dad wanted to make something special and i said dad can you really do it you will be so tired because it's going to come back only at 10 o'clock when will you get uh, he irons all his clothes for uh, church the next day and gets ready and everything so you know he kept on listening to what i was saying whether you can do it whether you can do it and then he said you know what you know and then he started off in the old what and all god has done so i said okay uh, dad what's the point so when god has enabled me he can enable me even now to do this even if the current comes back at 10 o'clock okay so just thinking how you know he's always talking about the things that god has done in the past and he's instilling in us that faith and that trust in god and i think that is very important for us to speak about god testify about what god has done to people children you have grandchildren please tell them as well okay so we'll move on i got carried away with um, with that okay so where am i now yeah so you know for abraham to come to that place he was fully persuaded that god would fulfill the promise that he would do what he said he would do and it did not happen overnight his journey of faith and it was not a smooth journey of faith but he got to the place where he was fully persuaded that what god has promised for his life god will perform it amen James chapter 2 verse 22 can somebody read that please James 2 22 James 2 22 do you see the faith was working together with his work and by works faith was made perfect Amen. So he says that through Abraham's works, his faith was made perfect. And the actual word is mature. Okay. So how do we come to this place of mature faith? We see this in verses 17 to 21. Okay. So the first thing he's already established for us, Paul, is that we have to walk in the steps of faith. Okay. And verse 17, he's quoting this promise. I have made you a father of many nations so god put this in the heart of abraham and god decided that he would do this in the life of abraham that he was going to make him the father of many nations and when god put this in the heart of abraham or this is what god planned to do it was something that was already a completed done thing a finished thing in the heart and mind of god now abraham is hearing this promise from god and who is this God? For him, this God is a God who gives life to the dead, who calls things which do not exist as though they did. Amen. So that is the God that Abraham is looking at and his faith has grown into. Okay. So, yes, God gave him this promise. But who is this God for Abraham? This God is a God who gives life to the dead and calls things that do not exist as though they did so two things about god one is god gives life to the dead okay things that look dead you know in our lives god can resurrect he can revive and he can give life to that so some of your dreams some of the prophecies are spoken over your life some of the promises that god has given to you you don't see that you know it is a dead thing in your life it is something that god can give life to that even our health See, sometimes we think, hey, we have to live with this health issue. The doctor said we can't do anything about it. You'll have to control it by this, this, this. You know, and we think, yeah, we accept it. But, you know, that is not what God has asked us to do. What is, what is our blessing? What is our blessing? Healing is our blessing. Healing is our birthright. Healing is the children's bread, right? That is a covenant blessing, okay? And so if that is dead in your life, that uh, sickness or that part of the body is causing death in your life. You know, you need to speak life into that, the life of God, because God resurrects, revives, and gives life to things that are dead. Amen? So any things in your, in your life, in your situations, your dreams, broken dreams, you know, whatever relationships, God can give life to the dead. Amen? 
And we look at the, the verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12. Can somebody read that, please? Hebrews 11, verse 12. Hebrews 11, verse 12. Therefore, for one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as a sand which is by the seashore. Amen. See how beautiful the language is here, right? It says from one man who is good as dead, from such a man came generations. So many, so many, as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, which we cannot even count, innumerable. So from one man who is good as dead, you know, comes a nation that is innumerable. So this is telling us something about God and how he works in our lives. Things in our life, situations in our life are good as dead. But God can release something huge, something big, something unimaginable. And that is what he did in Abraham's life. Amen. So how did Abraham position himself to see that? This is what Paul explains in the upcoming verses. Okay. So when God speaks his promise to our heart, or God speaks promise to you, to any, to people, to prophecies. Keep these two things in mind. He's inviting us to believe in him as the one who gives life to the dead. Amen. Even if it's impossible, he can give life to that. Our situations may look hopeless, helpless. Okay, it's, that is not a problem to God. Okay, our hopeless, helpless situations is not a problem to God. This is something we need to keep in mind, that when God gives us a promise, he can call things that do not exist as though they did. Okay, it's not there, but, you know, God is saying, it's not there, but he says it is there. You can't see it, but God says, hey, it is there. We can tell God, God, we still haven't become who you want me to become. But God is saying, hey, I have made you to become that. So you have to believe. Or another example, we can look at ourselves and say, God, I am weak. But God says, hey, I made you strong. You know, we can say, God, I think I'm so foolish. How can I go and preach and teach? He says, you know, I've given you my wisdom, my counsel, my word. It's in your lips. It's on your tongue. So he's calling what does not exist as though they did. Amen. We, look, can, we can look at ourselves and say, God, I'm not a conqueror. But God says, I have made you more than a conqueror. Amen? Okay? So we can say, God, I have not yet become that. But God says, hey, I have made you that. Right? So God tells Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations. But Abraham did not even have one child. He's not even the father of one child. But God says, I have made you a father of many nations. Okay, so that is something that, uh, you know, we can learn from um, this, okay. I will just stop here because it's time, but I hope, uh, you know, this has spoken to you. It's very powerful that, you know, we can look at what we are not, but God speaks and tells us what we are, what he has promised us, what he has created us, who he has, you know, um, uh, made us alive in him to be, uh, what our, uh, you know, his nature has given us and what is identity that he's given to us and who we are in Christ. We need to operate out of that. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, so we'll end class. Thank you, everyone. I'll meet you tomorrow and we'll finish chapter four tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Have a blessed day ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm.